Welcome to the City Club of Portland, Oregon's most respected public forum. The City Club was founded in 1915 as a civic research organization. Today its members are 2,000 men and women who share a common interest in the quality of life and government in the Portland metropolitan community. The City Club meets on Fridays at noon in downtown Portland to present speakers selected for their distinction in specialized fields, their knowledge of specific issues, and the freshness and vitality of their ideas. And now the club's presiding officer will introduce today's speaker, U.S. Senator Mark Hatfield. The advent of the new federal economic strategy makes for lively press. Daily reports from Washington identify new budget targets, while various political factions jockey for the credibility in their forecasts and predictions. As evidenced by this week's events, the debates and its rhetoric continues to intensify. As chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Mark Hatfield sits in the center of the rising economic debate. He represents a powerful force in guiding the federal appropriations process in establishing federal spending priorities and in providing a direct link in addressing the local economic impacts. The Senator's most important debate, however, may explore the philosophical resolution of economic growth, consumerism, and his party's supply-side economics. Our topic today concerns the economic experiment and the discussions currently underway. Mark Hatfield is a native Oregonian and his public service record represents an impressive commitment to state and country. He served four years as state representative, two years as state senator, two years as secretary of state, and eight years as governor. He was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1966 and re-elected again in 1972 and 1978. In seniority, he is currently the fifth ranking Republican. In addition to his responsibilities as chairman of the powerful Senate Appropriations Committee, he serves on the Senate Rules and Administration Committee and the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Our topic today is the economic Dunkirk, and it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the senior senator from Oregon, the Honorable Mark Hatfield. Thank you, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the Portland City Club. This is sort of a period of nostalgia for me in the last 24 hours. It's my privilege to address the joint session of the Oregon Legislature an hour or so ago and last night to come through Seattle in order to pay tribute to the uh, former chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Senator Warren Magnuson. In that meeting in Seattle, I indicated to the audience that <clears throat> my arrival in the Senate, I uh, was tutored pretty well by uh, two senators from the Northland, Senator Jackson on the old Interior Committee and Senator Magnuson on the Commerce Committee. And then when I moved to the Appropriations Committee at the end of my first term, and later when Senator Magnuson became the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, I told the Seattleites I learned my lessons well because I could recall Warren Magnuson saying to me, Mark, just always remember, what is good for Washington is good for Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> and when it came time to cut the pie, it used to be Warren Magnuson would say, a billion for me, a million for you. <laughs> So that I wanted to remind that Seattle audience that now, under the change of administration, what is good for Oregon is good for Washington. A billion for me and a million for them. When David Stockman, the new director of Office of Management and Budget, declared that we were facing an economic Dunkirk, 
This description of the economy raised uh, quite a controversy in the Washington press. For that matter, across the country in the economic and political circles of this country. But I uh, would have to say that I would believe that perhaps the analogy is correct, that our back is to the sea. And this has not happened within the last administration or the last few administrations. One has to recognize that this has been in the making for almost 50 years and that we are now reaping the results of whirlwinds that we sowed in terms of policies, economic policies, uh, by both Democratic and previous Republican administrations. If we want to look at what was called the misery index in the period of the 1976 election, that's when you take the inflation rate and add it to the unemployment rate, let us be mindful that in 1960 that rate was 7.3 percent and today it is 17.2 percent. We have uh, lost the race in economic productivity to the point where our competitiveness in the world markets is perhaps at an all-time low. And I think that the vast majority of Americans have perceived this situation. They are very much <coughs> aware of the circumstances, not only as it faces their grocery budget, their housing budget, their clothing budget, but they're also recognizing very, <coughs> very definitely that their bill to the federal government in the form of tax and to the state governments and to the local governments have reached this situation of crisis proportion. But I also want to say right off the bat, so to speak, that I believe that the President, the Congress, and the people together can make a change. Circumstances do change. Programs can become obsolete. And recognizing these trends, I think we have an historic opportunity to alter the direction, the scope, and perhaps even the character of the federal government more than any time since the advent of the New Deal in 1933. And the course ahead is, of course, with sacrifice, many sacrifices. In the domestic area, let me cite two local examples. The pro program that the Reagan administration has advanced would put into two block grants the some 45 educational programs that now are administered through categorical format. This would mean that with the 25% reduction, that for the fiscal year 81-82, it would impact on the Portland School District to the amount of some $4 million. That is $4 million less than what the Portland School District is now uh, receiving from these various and sundry categorical grant programs. In the field of transportation, under the Interstate Transfer Authority, Portland has over $120 million in projects slated for 1982. Of that total, it appears as of now, only 50 million will be funded. And that would indicate, of course, again, a rather significant impact upon the sacrifice of transportation and in the field of education as it would relate to the Portland area. Let us move to some of the costs that are involved in some of the plans that are now being promoted by the Reagan administration to deal with them. Oftentimes, as today, when your president introduced me as the chairman of that powerful appropriations committee, people have the opinion that somehow that budget of FY81 of $650 billion has all been evaluated and appropriated by the appropriations committee. Let me say to you that if one extrapolates the $150 billion that is in this present fiscal year budget for the military, which has taken on a certain air of sacrosanct as far as budgetary cuts are concerned. And if one then looks at the remaining part of that budget, out of the remaining part of $500 million, billion, 
The Appropriations Committee has power to control the allocation of $100 billion only. The rest of that is set into law by what we call entitlements. Entitlements of grants and programs that are very specifically defined by category, by criteria, by entitlement under law. And therefore, they are in place. And the only way to change those is by legislative action of changing the Organic Act. Among these that are most notable and well recognized are those dealing with what we call the safety net that the Reagan administration has defined as being outside of the realm of reduction. This is Social Security recipients, federal pensioners, and veterans. Now the assumption being that these people are all in need and therefore these entitlements cannot be uh, considered as far as change is concerned. Let me remind you that in the fiscal year 81 to 86, these programs are all indexed and the indexing will increase the budget by $272 billion, just these few programs, without one action on the part of the Congress in changing the law. This is an enormous lack of control that we exercise today in the affairs of budget and budget making. Now, I want to handle this next, these next few comments as carefully as I can because they lend themselves to more emotional reaction than intellectual reaction. I wonder if it is wise to exclude these entitlement programs of Social Security, veterans, and the pensioners from a scrutiny that we are applying to other programs. Today, we are paying $200 billion in these entitlement programs, just in these three categories, without any reference to need. We are paying $1 billion this year in Medicare payments to individuals who have an income independent income in excess of $30,000 a year. We know that half of the couples in the Social Security program today, half of the couples have an outside income averaging above $13,000 a year. We also know that one-third of all Social Sec Security recipients have a higher independent income than the payment they're receiving. I only cite these few examples to illustrate my concern that this federal budget should have no part that is exclusive of careful scrutiny that we are applying today, and we should not understand any longer that we can tolerate an uncontrollable part of that budget. All of that budget must be brought under some kind of control. Now this is not threatening to those who are in need because we know that half of the people of this country under the poverty line are not receiving benefits from these programs that I have just enumerated and the most that many of them receive is a free school lunch for their children. So I'm not suggesting in any way that we attack the Social Security program as it relates to those who are totally dependent or in major part dependent upon the, rec the receipts from that program that they receive monthly. Now we come to another part of that budget and that is that part of the blueprint that relates to taxes. I need not tell you because you're already aware of the new payroll tax that you are trying to live under that we have reached an all-time high in the percentage of our GNP that is taken up by taxation. 24.7% of our GNP will be now 
I, the tax picture, the tax bite put on the American public. The previous record was at the height of World War II. And that percentage at that time was 22%. Obviously, we need to enact tax relief and tax revision. Right now, there, are, there is an argument in the Congress as to how we approach the tax relief problem. Senator Dole of Kansas and I have co-sponsored a bill that we think brings at least a focus on one area of tax relief that is desperately needed and that is to provide incentives for saving, which is so much a part of our whole fiscal problem today. We have introduced a program that would give tax-free savings accounts up to $1,500 a year, which in our view would help stimulate not only savings in t but in turn the housing market that so much is in depression today. The White House Conference on Small Business concluded that the federal policies often handicap rather than aid our nation's small business. And in Oregon, we have had in recent history, I think a reflection of this ominous nationwide trend. Small, locally owned businesses have been purchased, merged, swallowed up, cannibalized, whatever you want to describe it by international corporations and national corporations. These larger corporations often are not as responsive to local needs or as concerned with the long-term health and the vitality of the local community as those businesses which are owned and operated by families who have spent their lifetime in the area. That is not parochialism, that is fact of life. And moreover, the nation's largest corporations are contributing the fewest number of new jobs in the employment picture. Those companies with 500 or fewer employees have added 7.5 million new workers in the last five years. Those firms with 20 employees or less provide over two-thirds of our additional jobs, new jobs, each year. That's where the growth factor is in the American enterprise system. The Fortune 500 has a very slow, low growth record. One half of the innovations that we enjoy are provided out of the enterprises that we call small business. However, only 3.5% of the federal research monies goes to small business. Current tax benefits for accelerated appreciation are so complex that only the larger firms can take advantage of those tax provisions. 94% of the large corporations use the complicated systems of assets depreciation range, while less than 1% of small businesses use it. Thus, those companies, over $10 million in assets, which represents 1.3% of all firms, get 75% of the benefits. Now, I'm supporting the 1053 in the tax relief for large corporations, but I also have joined with 16 of my colleagues in the Senate in introducing an omnibus small business tax bill that addresses capital formation and estate tax relief. The last time the Congress acted on taxes relating to small business problems was in 1958. Now another factor in the economic package is regulation. This is uh, not an easy subject to mention because the subject matter and the examples are so vast. But let me take that example that some of you have heard perhaps about the regulation regarding the lowly hot dog. I would like to recite to you the federal regulations in case any of you are thinking about beginning an enterprise in manufacturing hot dogs. There's a regulation for federal on-site inspectors 
if required if the hot dog is shipped in interstate commerce. There's a regulation that relates to meeting pure food standards. There's another regulation that no more than 30% fat content and no more than 10% moisture content can be incorporated in the hot dog. There's another regulation that no more than one part preservative per 5,000 parts. Another federal regulation, coloring dyes may not be injurious to health and only the casing can be artificially colored and you have to state that. Another regulation, extenders used in hot dogs, soy, flour, cereal, cannot exceed three and one half percent of the weight. Another regulation, labels must get advanced approval of government. Another regulation, labels must contain all the ingredients in descending order of the amounts used. And lastly, another regulation that labels must bear net weight, manufacturer's name and address, and a federal inspection stamp. Now that's the hot dog. There's another way to describe this problem. The Federal Register reflects the kind of regulation trend in this nation. In 1955, the Federal Register had 10,000 pages. In 1970, it had 20,000 pages. And in 1979, 77,000 pages. Those are regulations. The overall cost of regulation in each year of paperwork alone is $25 billion in our economy. The compliance cost to federal regulations is another $85 billion annually. And the 5% of the GNP that government regulation takes up as a share of the nation's resource. I need not say to you that we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater in reforming regulation, but we have to get a handle on this trend of overregulation and the cost it means to our economy. Now I have made comments about sacrifices that will have to be made by all. A few years ago, Lloyd Douglas said this, you think that sacrifice gives people a certain nobility of spirit, and that is true. But if sacrifice is such a good thing, it ought to be passed around a little so that other members of one's family may benefit by it as well. <laughs> I use the Douglas quotation to get to my next point, and that is, in my opinion, the Department of Defense ought to be part of the sacrifice that the American people are being asked to give. We find ourselves today projecting a defense military budget for the next five years of one trillion four hundred billion dollars. One trillion four hundred billion in the next five years, and that presumes an inflation rate of 7.2 percent and an unemployment rate less than 6% and interest rates at 8.9%. <laughs> Need I say that those assumptions are undergoing a certain challenge at this moment. In the State of the Union message, President Reagan talked about the federal deficit approaching $1 trillion. And he illustrated that, if you recall, by saying that if we took $1,000 bills and stacked them on end, they would reach 67 miles high. Using that same analogy for the projection of the military spending for the next five years, that same stack of $1,000 bills would reach a height of 100 miles high. This enormous commitment to weapons and personnel poses profound questions and I think also some enormous dangers. These sums may not be readily absorbed fast enough by our defense industries for one concern that I have, and that then may cause added inflation. The strangulation of capital resources required for the reindustrialization of non-defense industry 
will be definitely threatened. And remember that these are not selectively applied to areas of military spending that truly need support. And I speak to those military deficiencies today of the readiness factors, pay, operation and maintenance, infrastructure, strong reserves, all of these are today undernourished in the military because we have become so mesmerized by exotic new weapons systems that are questionable, highly speculative, unproven. Let me suggest that there are alternatives. The XM1 tank that is one of those candy store goodies that are being that is being touted by the Pentagon will cost 1.75 million dollars each under present day estimates. And most of those military weapons systems have had five, six, and seven hundred percent overruns by the time they are online. For a few thousand dollars, we have the technical capacity today to develop a laser anti-tank weapon that can destroy a tank instantaneously. We talk about the MX missile that started out, as you recall, the Air Force's first projection was 30 billion, and then they revised that upward to 107 billion and the Office of Technical Assistance has only a week ago estimated that it may go as high as $120 billion. And for a fraction of that, we can put the Minuteman three missiles on submarines, put them to sea, take them out of their vulnerability that they exist, that exist now, which is the reason for the MX missile, and not have ourselves escalated into a new generation of missiles, to a new threshold of preemptive war, and at the same time save barrels and barrels of money. It's not a question of being anti or pro-military. It's a matter of saying to the taxpayer that military dollar ought to have the same cost-effective analysis and the same scrutiny that you put to the dollar that goes for food stamps and for any other federal program. We have a call in this country today for reindustrialization. That's going to be a part of the economic recovery. Do you realize how much the Japanese have been and are putting into capital resources to undergird their industry? In 1968, Toyota spent $16,000 on equipment and machinery per employee, compared to General Motors' 11900 in 1978, Toyota doubled that amount to $40,800 per employee, while GM stayed at the same level of 11,900. Similarly, Japan spends 21% of its GNP on industrial investments. The United States percentage is 10% less than half. This helps explain why Japan's productivity growth rate is three times that of ours. Reindustrialization of the United States industry will require hundreds of billions of new capital for the nation's synthetic fuels program, tax incentives for energy conservation, and increasing depreciation deductions. Former Secretary of Transportation Neil Goldschmidt estimated that over $2 trillion will have to be spent to bring the nation's vast transportation network up to par that alone, that one industry alone, that amount of capital. Tens of billions of dollars more will be required to save heavy industry bases in the Northeast and in the Midwest. And these examples represent only a fraction of the task before us. And that's why all these programs will require largest infusion of capital in the history of our industrial life why it is serious then to consider the defense dollar in relation to our economic recovery. For it was the Shah of Iran as our latest historic example who indicated to us should have that military hardware alone does not secure your political base. The economic prosperity of a nation, its productivity is as major a component of our national security as is our hardware. 
It's not an either or, it's a balance between the two. Now there are other principles that we are wrestling with because we cannot solve the energy problem or we cannot solve the economic problem without addressing the energy problem. <clears throat> Need I tell you that there has been a change in the new administration's approach to energy. The conservation program in the new budget has been reduced 76 percent. The solar program has been reduced 60 percent. The nuclear program has been increased 52 percent. I think we have to ask ourselves a question or two here. The cheapest, the most economic, new energy source is conservation. And ultimately, we have to get out of the programs that are placing us in a dependency role on imported energy. But we have yet to develop a comprehensive storage program for nuclear waste in this country, and it is proliferating around this country, and to speak of and to ask for increased expenditures in an area which has not yet addressed one of the most serious of all problems, to me, is not wise. <clears throat> I think we have to look at these reductions. We have to be willing to make them. We are making an appropriation, or we are considering an appropriation request for the Clinch River Breeder Reactor, a reactor that produces no new technology, a reactor that, if anything, I look upon as a regional employment program, more than of a research project that's going to develop new technology. This is by the testimony of the Nuclear Regulatory Commissioners, former Secretary of Energy, Dr. Schlesinger, and others who are aware, very much the experts in the field. And yet what is being asked for in FY82 for the Clinch River Breeder Reactor would pay for both the cuts in conservation programs and in the solar programs. That one project in Tennessee that has been debated in the last five sessions of the Congress and one of these days we hope to knock it in the head for sure and for certain and turn our back on that project and get on with other business. <laughs> Don't tell Senator Baker I made such a comment. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, William Thompson once said that we were approaching an historic period of enormous challenge, an age tossed by storms. We live, he said, at a moment between the flash of lightning and the roaring thunder of realization. Of course the tasks ahead are enormous, but let me say I have such confidence and faith based upon historic precedent that the Republic is a resilient Republic and that with the kind of leadership that I believe we have within the people of this nation, within the government of this nation, that we can with courage, with creativity, solve these problems and move America even into a greater age ahead. Thank you very much. We now come to the question and answer period. There is a microphone that's being placed in the center of the room. Uh, I would ask you if you would like to address a question, please be recognized by the chair. Uh, you may use the microphone. If you do not, I will paraphrase the question for the radio audience. Who has the first question for the Senator? Mr. President, with reference to the nuclear energy comments, what are the French doing? I understand they're bringing one new plant, one, nucle one new nuclear plant online every other month. What are they doing with the waste problem in France? The question is, what are the French doing with the nuclear waste problem? They haven't solved it any more than we have. I think what they're looking increasingly, the rest of the world, is for the United States to provide the solution. We're finding that's true at state and local government levels. We're seeing this is true within the Western allies. As you know, under the international economic treaty, that, or energy treaty we have, that we have with the NATO countries, this treaty 
indicates that when there is a cutoff of the supply from any one source to any one members of the treaty, that that kind of cutoff or that reduction will be spread equally across the lives of all the treaty members. And also we have in that energy treaty uh, a commitment to solve uh, the waste programs that we now have, or to create the waste programs that we have yet to, to do. Uh, we had the, the testimony of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission just this, uh, this week, this last week. And I pressed them on this matter of the, of the time frame. <clears throat> Secretary of Energy also was there, Mr. Edwards. He said, we do not have a lack of knowledge. We do not have a real lack of technology. The point is that we have selected the technology or we have identified it as storage and there are three areas. Louisiana and Mississippi being two of them. And both senators, or the senators from both of those states sitting on the Appropriations Committee said, oh no, not in our state. So the point is, Mr. Edwards said, if I do not do anything else in this administration, I hope that I will have the courage to make that decision and to move ahead with it. Well, <clears throat> that's noble rhetoric. But let me say that I can imagine that uh, Senator Johnson, Senator Stennis would be two of the first people to file some kind of a court action, a legal action to prevent the federal government from making their states a storage for that kind of waste. Nobody wants it. And so we have not made the political decision as to the matter of storage. And it is a political decision at this point. Next question. The microphone. Thank you. Excuse me. Is this on? Excuse me, no. Senator Hatfield. Uh, recently, the rhetoric has seemed to be increasing between our country and the Soviet Union, and yet I seem to be getting some inconsistency that our country is strongly criticizing the Soviet Union's supply of arms to many countries, and yet there's also a great deal of talk about our country supplying a great deal of arms to more countries. At what point does our foreign policy become inconsistent in arms supply, and also are we increasing the rhetoric uh, right now with the Soviet Union to a point where it's going to be hard to back down from? <clears throat> I think that one could justifiably say that the shipment of arms, by the way, we are the largest arms peddler of any country in the world today. And I think we could say <clears throat> with uh, correctness that our shipment of arms is to try to stabilize and try to defend uh, status quo governments. The Soviet arms that are exported in large part is an attempt to create change and overthrow, revolution. Now whether or not that is sufficient differential or justification, it is to some, it doesn't happen to be to me, but it does appear to be sufficient differentiation to maintain this high level on arms export that we have. But let me indicate that I think that this is misreading the picture because I don't know where arms to third world countries have really contributed to the stability, especially when they're wrought with starvation, famine, and the destabilizing force that hunger represents. It didn't happen so in Vietnam, and I don't know where it can in the world today. We are sending arms at ever increasing amounts into many of these areas of the world, which really do not have foodstuffs to feed their people. And more than a, than a shortage, there is an actual famine. And yet the economic aid has been reduced in the federal budget for FY82, whereas the arms for foreign shipment has been, that segment has been increased. Now the Russians uh, and El Salvador, where we have seemingly drawn the line, let me say I'm interpolating, but I don't believe that this is a line in the sense that the Soviets and we are ready for confrontation. I think what this is, is a new administration attempting to establish its foreign policy and to reverse that which was perceived by the Soviet Union of an indecisive America, of an America uncommitted, unsure, of America that was flaccid and flabby. And I think this administration, which campaigned on the basis that it was going to establish a clear foreign policy that but put the Soviets on notice that we weren't about ready to, to back off and to fail in our global leadership role. And I think, frankly, this is what they're doing. El Salvador was the first on the docket. 
All right, we're going to make our new foreign policy and communicate and signal what that policy is vis-a-vis -vis El Salvador. Uh, I think it's very interesting, Mr. Duarte has said we do not want any more personnel and we do not want any more arms. And in fact, when they reprogrammed, sent their reprogramming message up to the Appropriations Committee, Secretary Haig did a few weeks ago, for a $20 million reprogramming of military aid to El Salvador, the New York Times quoted Mr. Duarte that he had not asked for it. So I asked uh, the Assistant Secretary of State uh, if this were true, and he said, oh no, no, they have asked for it. I said, would you show me the documentation? Well, you don't ask a president to sign a paper. And I said, well, no, I would like those to see the documentation of message or communication. The next day, Mr. Duarte had a new press statement in which he said, well, I have asked for it. I don't know if there's any correlation there between those. <laughs> <laughs> now, <clears throat> let us not be, oh, that, that, uh, that begs uh, another point. And that is, I do not treat the adventurism of Cuba and through uh, Cuba by the Soviet Union uh, into Central America. I don't think we can treat it lightly. And I'm very certain that uh, I'm convinced that those are arms that have been supplied. I've seen the evidence that convinces me that the Cubans uh, are there, that is, with their equipment. But I do have to come back to myself and say uh, there are 5,000 Marxist guerrillas and there are 4.3 million people. If you add all of the political leftists in uh, El Salvador today, you have about 20,000. And you have the rest of the public in El Salvador today pretty much either emerging as the Social Democratic Party, which is the party of uh, Helmut Schmidt, International Socialist Party, or the Christian Democratic Party, or a conservative party. The vast majority of these people are non-Marxists. I still can't believe that uh, a regime uh, cannot be helped economically, whatever needs they have economically, and stabilize that regime for an election, perhaps by a mediating force from outside, and do this through the economic diplomatic channels rather than just escalating the, the military involvement. The other day, we got a commitment from the administration that 54 American personnel, including Green Berets, who are there now, is a cap. In order to remind them of that, we have asked them to submit to the Appropriations Committee under the War Powers of the President's Act a weekly report of any indicated change in that policy that would change that cap. So that we are going to keep that kind of pressure on them, reminding them that as far as the Appropriations Committee is concerned, and I speak for both the Republicans and Democrats, we aren't going to appropriate and appropriate in an escalation, in an escalation of military involvement in El Salvador. We do not see the American interest in that direction. That's the microphone. Dave Tyler, member. Senator Hatfield, it's difficult to believe the MX proposal is even seriously considered. What are the chances of avoiding the 4,800 <coughs> empty holes in the concrete racetracks and getting those things <coughs> off the land and into the sea? I think there's some remarkable changes that have been taken, taking place since the MX missile was debated first uh, in the Congress last, last Congress when uh, I sought to stop this $900 million uh, appropriation. At that time, the leaders of the propon and proponents of the MX missile were Senator Garn of Utah, Senator Laxalt of Nevada, Senator Howard Cannon of Nevada. Now we find a very interesting shift of opinion as it becomes better known as to what it really involves. It would be the largest construction project ever undertaken by humankind, bigger than the Panama Canal, the pyramids, or any other physical structure. We find now that the Nevada Cattlemen's Association <laughs> has made, uh, passed a resolution opposing the MX missile in their area. <laughs> We find that the Mormon church has passed a resolution. <laughs> now, when you can get from cattlemen to the Mormon church uh, on, on, on this issue, as far as representing significant local areas and groups, it's very interesting that now there is far less enthusiasm. I haven't heard Senator Garn or Senator Cannon speak on the floor or before our committee for the MX missile in, in about a year. Now, there is still one problem. Uh, there are those who say, well, your proposal that you made, I made this sum proposal, it's called sum, 
this uh, underwater submarine, uh, s s this underwater missile launching of submarines. I had proposed that we do it with the Minuteman III. Now there's increasing talk, well, let's build the MX missile, but let's put it on a submarine. Well, that still puts us into a new generation of missiles that I do not think is necessary. But uh, I think there is great movement. You remember when I got into the huge debate about two years ago with Sam Nunn on the neutron bomb, that he wanted to get all cranked up and get deployed out there in Europe, and we asked him one simple question, what's the position of our allies? Those are the people whose countries it would have to be deployed to in order to be effective. And of course, we got nothing but signals back, negative signals. Well, now uh, General Haig says in our committee, the neutron bomb is no longer on my wish list. It's a perspective of time. Sometimes people think, well, you're just delaying the decision. You're just delaying, it's going to cost more. I suggest to you that the longer we can delay and get consideration of some of these exotic set systems that have festooned the Pentagon for too long, uh, the more logic and, I think, intelligence we can apply to it. But right now, when they talk about increasing their budget 32% or $32 billion in one year, it's like turning kids loose in a candy store. Why they're so ecstatic, they're so excited, they don't know what to do. They want one of these and two of these and three of these and four of these, you know. <laughs> they're even going to bring out the old battle wagons again. <laughs> and uh, Lord knows I'm a Navy man and get thrilled when I sail past the bow of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Harbor in 1945 and all of that, but a battle wagon in today's world? Why, they couldn't man it, or woman it either. <laughs> so uh, what we have to do is to look at these systems with a little more anal analytical view than just an emotional reaction. I had a very interesting response from one of the heads of the armed services, and I will not name him in public because it would probably cause him difficulty. But he came to my office here a few weeks ago and he said, I just want to tell you I think you're right. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? He said, we ought to call time, and that's how he put it, time, and decide first what kind of a military organization we need, that we want, as it relates to our allies, as it relates to our global foreign policy, and then start spending the money. This was one of the heads of the branches of the military services. And uh, I think if you got them off in a room that each one would say, we don't have any blueprint on where we're headed. We're just having money dumped on us because you see there's a mentality rampant today in the Congress that every dollar more that you spend for the military buys us another dollar's worth of security. And the, Demo the Republicans used to criticize Mr. Roosevelt and the Democrats, and well, they should have, that the whole New Deal philosophy was throw enough money at a social problem and you can solve it. But that's precisely what we're doing today with the national security problem. We think that more money we throw at it, the more security we're going to establish and, sec and, and buy for ourselves. I'm not anti-military, I'm not a pacifist, I'm not all these other labels that have been hung on me because I've raised questions about some of these things and I will continue to raise them. Chemical warfare. This is the only negotiation which the Soviet Union has agreed on to on-site inspection. That's how far we've progressed on negotiations on controlling chemical warfare. And yet they want to commit themselves to a four billion program, dollar program in restarting chemical warfare up again. And what is it? It hits civilians, military protect against it. And so it's a civilian aim, really. And where is it going to be most likely used? In Europe. And what are our allies' view about deployment? No, we don't want it on our soil. And yet there are those who want to crank up this four billion. We stopped the $19 million beginning last year. I don't know if we can stop it again this year, but these are things that I think beg some careful, objective analysis, rather than just emotionally saying anything that says it's a military weapon we're going to build and buy. There's a question way in the back. Rivera. On a local level, do you still support the Banfield light rail project and is it going to be funded? On a local level, do you still support the Banfield light, light rail program? Yes, I do. And I, and I tell you why. The whole basis of our society is, I think, uh, founded on contract and the, and the integrity of contract. 
And I think one of the reasons that we have so much disillusionment today with the federal government and politicians in general is that somehow they say one thing and do another or they promise one thing and they don't live up to it. Now remember that the city of Portland, I'm not going to argue the wisdom of this, this was a local decision. I have enough problems of my own there without getting into local problems. <laughs> decided that they wanted to substitute this light rail system and have a withdrawal of an interstate uh, segment of the interstate program. And that was their right to do under the law. And they did that on the commitment made by the federal government that that monies would then be av made available for the alternative system. Now we went through a whole budget or a whole budgetary program, but more especially a bureaucratic system. You know what the new definition of bureaucracy is in Washington is by which a system by which energy is turned into solid waste. <laughs> uh, we went through a whole bureaucratic exercise in trying to keep that uh, project alive through the mayorship of Mil Goldschmidt, and then after he left the mayorship, and even as of the last Congress, there was established in the Transportation Act. Uh, a commitment, and there was a letter of intent that was signed by the Department of Transportation Secretary to carry out this commitment to the people of Portland and the area. On that basis, I, uh, I support it. And I think with justification on the, as I say, because of contract and commitment made. Now, on the other transportation things that we have not yet fully funded, such as the ramp at Swan Island and many others, a total quite a sum of money here in the Portland area alone, I think that's where we'll find major cuts made and deferrals and stretch outs and what have you. But on the light rail that had a very specific contractual understanding and good faith the city of Portland, the people of this area moved ahead, committed themselves, and I think the federal government should live up to that part of the contract. Did you have a question, sir? We uh, wrote to you recently and uh, questioned cuts in Amtrak and marine research and programs like that and suggested possibly that an area like tobacco subsidies might be more justified. You indicated that they are being reduced and will be. Specifically, what are we talking about here? The, the Amtrak. On the Amtrak changes? Tobacco, tobacco subsidies. Uh, Senator Helms of uh, North Carolina, <laughs> and I have not yet reached an accord. <laughs> we are working on that treaty, and uh, <laughs> we're trying to keep it down just to tobacco and leave out the school prayers and abortion and a few other things. <laughs> He's very anxious to make it a multi-issue treaty. Uh, all I can say is that uh, there are those who are pressing onward. <laughs> for that elimination of the tobacco subsidy. If we can reduce the milk subsidy, I have high hope that we can tackle then this ultimate subsidy of all, the, the tobacco subsidy, or offset it with the um, reduction in the Surgeon General's budget. <laughs> we have time for one more short question in front. Can you tell us what will happen with President Reagan's <coughs> proposed cut of Legal Services Corporation funding? Legal Services Corporation funding, can you tell us what will happen? I think we're going to see a major cut in that. Uh, there had been a growing feeling amongst uh, uh, even the press previous administration that either some criteria or some restrictions had to be placed where we were in effect paying people to sue the government and to so forth and so on and then the cost of government defending itself and it was a bothersome thing to a lot of people usually spelled out in some of their own areas of bias or their own local area experiences uh, I happen to feel very strongly that uh, when we talk about the dispossessed or the people who are poor and the people who are not uh, have access to resources whether it's physical resources or educational resources or job resources that in this day when we are living in a culture that has such a strong adversary relationship, such a strong compliance in this society of ours on the part of government and other things, that uh, all peoples ought to have access to legal counsel as well as to medical and health counsel. I think those have become as important rights as the right of speech and the right we put in the Bill of Rights, the rights, all of them. And uh, so the question then is how can it best be delivered? 
You see, uh, again, uh, we get into these things where the Reagan administration is looked upon as, as just abandoning a lot of these programs. Remember this, the, the budget's going to be in FY82 higher than it was in 81. Uh, it is not an abolition as much as it is a reduction on the rate of growth that many of these cuts are represented. Rates of growth rather than abolition of such commitments or programs. I think the key to the Reagan program is how do we allow for the time required for transition from either a categorical to block grant, from a federal role to a state and local role, or from a federal role to a private sector role. That's going to be the real problem, the real key. Frankly, I think they have the right direction in mind. Let me close my remarks here today by quoting my old friend uh, Phil Hart, the late senator from Michigan, one of the very outstanding members of the United States Senate. The new Taj Mahal has been named after him. That's the new Senate office building, in case any of you have forgotten <laughs> what the Oregonian used to call it. Uh, Phil Hart and I were into conversation one day about six months before he died. He said, you know, I don't remember what the issue was, but he said, I have a sense of growing ambivalence about many of these issues. He said, you know, I grew up as a part of the New Deal. I worked for them. I'm a Democrat, a New Deal Democrat, and I believe deeply in Mr. Roosevelt and the whole New Deal philosophy. But he said, I increasingly find myself wanting to help dismantle some of those very things that were started under the New Deal. Because, he said, I think they have lived beyond the time when they were created to serve people. And they have reached a point where they have become a manipulator or a dominant force in the life of people to the diminution of their own independence and their own self-worth even. And I thought it was a very interesting philosophical point, not coming from a Jesse Helms, but coming from a Phil Hart, who wasn't about ready to abandon his heritage, but to review it. And I think one would re remember that many of these programs started in a depression period, survived through a war period, and yet, like so many things in government, we bestow eternal life upon programs when they should have had a sunset clause to force the congressional oversight, to force the congressional review at the end of a certain given period. So I think a lot of these programs that people are very concerned about today, social programs as I am, I think we have to look at them in ways in which we can help revive, uh, revive the initiative of people in local areas and the private sectors, perhaps to shoulder more of the responsibility of these social goals than looking for this growing complexity of federal government that frankly has not delivered and has a poor track record. And I only need to end by saying, look at manpower retraining as it relates to federal program and to private initiative through the private sector. And there is no comparison to the success ratio. And that, I think, can be replicated right across the field. But I do think we have to continue access to legal help and legal service for all of our people. Thank you. Thanks. Our thanks to Senator Hatfield. Today's presentation represented his ninth appearance before the City Club. We'll review your progress, but we'll invite you back. <laughs> Next week, it's Governor Otia. Meetings are videotaped on Fridays by Liberty Cable Television Incorporated and can be seen regularly on the following Monday at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. over this cable channel. This program is intended for the private use of our viewing audience and may not be used otherwise without the expressed and written permission of the City Club of Portland. Next Friday, March 27th, Governor Vic Gatia will deliver his annual address to the City Club.